So the full video now follows, where I've had the pleasure of discussing ESG with Connor Kehoe. Um, Connor is a former senior partner of McKinsey, is now a special advisor to BlackRock, and has recently taken on the chair of the International Integrated Reporting Council. I think the only thing we failed to cover was some form of definition of ESG. So ESG criteria are the set of standards for a company that socially conscious investors, interest, interested parties, might use to assess that company, screen potential investments, etc. Um, what do they stand for? So E is the environment. So think energy usage, product circularity, water, land use, ecolog ecological impact, etc. Um, the S is social, so uh, labour upskilling, benefits to consumers, fair pricing, privacy, health and well-being, uh, etc. And then finally, uh, G is governance, so think share buybacks, CEO pay, ethics, transparency, uh, general government, governance, external relations. So now we know roughly what we're talking about. Connor takes us into what it really means for organisations as it becomes the new normal in how we assess them. Connor, hello. Thank you for taking the time. That's a pleasure, Alex. Good to see you. So there's been a huge amount written and talked about ESG. I wonder if you'd simplify it for us. What does it really mean for organisations? What it really means is organisations are going to have to report on and more importantly, be concerned about two things. One is their impact on people and planet, which is shorthand for S and E, if you like. Governance is pretty far advanced, but um, the E part, environment and S, social, uh, probably needs a lot more thought uh, within organisations. So that's one dimension, reporting uh, on their impact and being conscious of their impact on people and planet. And the other dimension is reporting to investors on the risks the changes uh, in society or degradation in society or the environment might pose to the investor's uh, value. So you can see there are two dimensions to it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, absolutely. And, and speaking of investors, I mean, where's this primarily being driven from? One, one assumes investors are primary in making this happen. Well, there are, there's two sources of drive, uh, Alex, that I see. One is definitely investors. And investors are concerned about long-term value. Um, and for instance, if we owned together uh, a warehouse company in Florida uh, and uh, our investors would wonder what would happen to our warehouses if sea levels rose. So that's an example of investors concerned about the impact the environment might have on their investment. Um, the, the other uh, dimension, though, is millennials. Millennials as employees and consumers are now increasingly important to companies started not, not surprisingly with the consumer goods company, but it's working its way through industry. And, and they're demanding, to their great credit, that companies talk about their purpose. And if companies describe their purpose, it quickly leads to a program of improvement or of change in ENS, in environmental initiatives and social initiatives, and indeed some governance, in it, governance initiatives. Back to the investors for a moment. They're concerned about long-term value, as I said, but they also um, have a huge opportunity in selling ESG index funds. Uh, and behind ESG index funds are ratings. And behind the ratings are data on ES and G. So they're desperate that the, these data be robust and stable uh, so that their products are robust and stable. And this is a big opportunity for them. So there's those two, those investors trying to protect long-term value and trying also to take advantage of the demand for ESG funds. And then there are millennials whom large companies want to recruit, both as employees and indeed as consumers. So let's think about some of those, uh, that, perhaps that point about ratings and going to your work with the IIRC, the International Integrated Reporting Council, which is about consistency and reliability in reporting. There have clearly been some false starts in this area. Um, previous attempts to grade this in companies been embarrassed by certain corporate scandals thinking Dieselgate particularly. Just tell us more about the potential consistent, reliable future for those re reporting requirements. So reporting requirements uh, tend to have two bits to them, to make it simple. One is an overall narrative. Uh, in the UK, for instance, companies are required to produce a strategic report, which is an overall narrative from the directors. And in that narrative, they may well refer to uh, data, for instance, financial accounting data. And that's what the IRRC promotes. It's a narrative that encompasses both the financial and, for want of a better word, the non-financial, the ESG type data. Uh, and that, in turn, will force, will force, will require directors to think in the whole about their organizations um, and 
you know, hopefully then will lead to better behavior, which is the ultimate objective uh, of any of this type of reporting. So that's the narrative. Um, and the other dimension of reporting tends to be uh, data points. And these are defined by standards. And this is just like the accounting world. You know, you have a number you report called sales and there are accounting standards for how you calculate sales in different industries. So the, these data points are defined by standards. In the ESG world, the standards themselves are set by voluntary organizations. It's slightly confusing right now because there are lots of different voluntary organizations uh, with variations on the same theme. And the two big ones coming from two traditions are GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, which was set up about 20 years ago to get corporates to report on the impact they were having on the planet and on society. So that's a civil society orientation. And then the other tradition is more recent uh, and it's epitomized by SASB. And SASB seeks to get report, uh, corporates to report on the impact changes in the environment and society might have on the value of the corporation. So you can see it's a slightly different angle. So those are the two um, traditions, if you like, but there are many, many different variants and it is somewhat confusing. So from that, coming to the rating agencies, you can imagine that the ratings produced by different rating groups uh, can vary quite a bit. In fact, um, some academics have shown the correlation between them is only about 55%. And this is very different to debt rating agencies, which tend to be pretty aligned. Um, so what the, what the whole world of ratings would like, and indeed those who use them, the ESG index funds, would be to have one global system of standards that was a regulatory requirement so that everybody had to report it. And in the case of the investors, that was assured uh, so that they could rely on, on the numbers. So that's where we are right now. Uh, and that's some where we, or where we're trying to get to, but it's actually coming together now, having with a, with a lot talked about it for, for quite some time. So what, what does the near future look like? Well, what's driving change right now, and, and indeed, causing this world of voluntary standard setters and indeed voluntary framework providers to talk about consolidation, my word is probably too strong a word, but cooperation perhaps is a better word, is that the EU has decided it will regulate. Um, and it's likely uh, in the near future to ask companies operating in the EU to produce two sets of numbers, back to those two traditions we just talked about, one of which are civil society material numbers, and the other of which are called financially material or investor material numbers. And the EU intends not to invent new standards, but rather draw on the voluntary ones that are there today. So the whole world of ESG standard setters and framework providers is working hard right now to present the united front to the EU, because it is likely, uh, there is a chance that when the EU sets a standard, it sort of becomes a de facto global standard. And the EU is being quite sensitive in trying to take account I understand, uh, of US sensitivities. Um, so that at some stage when the US is re ready to regulate, which it isn't right now, um, we have a chance in non-financial or ESG reporting of having one global standard as against the two standards we have in financial reporting right now. Right now. I've been hearing some interesting things about artificial intelligence uh, or machine learning in this area, particularly its role in baselining data on, on the climate change aspect. Um, where does this come into the thinking? Well, AI and machine learning, as you know, uh, looks at an outcome and then looks at the factors that underpins that past outcome. Um, so it can be useful if you've got a set of um, outcomes that are of interest to you and you can detect what led to them because you could sort of detect those outcomes or predict those outcomes in the future. Now, this might be you buying a certain jacket and trying to figure out whether people who are the people like you who might buy the same jacket. But it may well be useful too uh, for those who are disclosing to investors what the risks are from changes in climate and the environment. Because if some countries or situations are more advanced, machine learning could be used to detect the underlying factors that led, let's say, to a bad outcome and then uh, use it to predict when such outcomes might occur elsewhere. So that would be one situation where a machine learning tool could, for instance, give you scenarios uh, for climate change, which you then, as a director, would build into um, your risk analysis of what happens to your company's assets under different 
climate change scenario. So that, that's one area. Um, there is a lot of um, many attempts now also to try to look at good ESG actors or ones that are recognized as good and see what underpins that, see if there are factors that uh, led to that outcome, which might be a useful way also of predicting in the future which companies are likely to be good actors and as an investor to get in there fast. We, I don't want us to get too sidetracked on that. We could probably talk about those sorts of areas all day. But I'm just returning to reporting. Companies won't be doing all of this themselves. Uh, I'm sure their hands will be held through a lot, of, a lot of this process. With or without the likes of McKinsey involved, how do you see this is likely to be implemented in companies? Well, the, the way I've seen large companies implemented, interestingly enough, is through purpose statements. So as I mentioned, uh, in order to recruit millennials as employees and to keep them, um, and then uh, for those who, especially those who market directly to consumers, to capture that new generation who are in that phase of building their households right now, an important phase for any consumer company or consumer durable company, uh, companies are finding that, ha that they have to have much greater clarity about what their purpose is in the world. You know, what positive, hopefully, or indeed negative impacts they're having on people and planet and what they're going to do to do a better job in the future. So this is almost a philosophical change from my generation, which was driven by Milton Friedman and which was all about maximize shareholder value within the law. And it's the law that ensures society and the planet is looked after. And now the emphasis is switching. Companies themselves have to consider the society and the planet rather than just work within the narrow or the confines of the law. They, they have to go beyond that. And that's what millennials are demanding. It's leading to companies to consider purpose statements. And as I say, from those purpose statements flow uh, programs of action on E, S and, and G. So that I, I think is one of the vehicles uh, through which this is getting implemented. Of course, there'll be uh, consultancies helping with that. And of course, uh, the uh, assurance firms, the audit firms, will fulfill a vital role uh, for investors in assuring whatever ESG numbers come out, just as they assure the financial numbers today, I, I would guess. Connor Kehoe, thank you so much for your time. It's a great pleasure, Alex. So in very brief summary, I've taken away three things. Firstly, that companies are going to have to take this seriously and consider how they report to society and investors. Secondly, that if organisations want to retain and attract millennials, they need to drive this through purpose statements and then follow that through into real action. And then thirdly, that nobody escapes, that this will be driven up and down supply chains, as everyone will expect it, of those who supply them and those, who are, and, and those they are supplying. Uh, this has been a hugely informative and, general use, and generous use of Connor's time. Do please comment below if you have any thoughts, additions or even contradictions. Many thanks.